Eye of the Storm, Part 1, by Andrew Hall. Extracted from the dailyplasma.blog, with permission from Andrew Hall. Narrated by Electric Universe Eyes. Earth's geology and weather is a result of capacitance in Earth's electric circuit. Forget anything you've been taught about geology. It's wrong. Provably wrong. From evidence you will soon see. Geology we are taught to associate with billions of years of tectonic forces is actually the result of capacitor discharge across Earth's atmospheric layers. The Earth's own electric circuit electroplated, etched, and arced to form the land patterned by the Earth's electric field. The first evidence of Earth's electrical formation is provided by the landscape. All one need to do is look at it. In this article you will be shown features created by electric winds. The challenge is to believe your eyes and take a serious look at the theory behind it, or to hide yourself in the consensus. The following images are just a teaser. An explanation and even more dramatic evidence will take some explaining, but first look at these basin and range mountains and contemplate what caused them. They look as if a blowtorch blasted the land, don't they? Admit they do. They are coherent flow patterns formed in concentric waves and this is undeniably so. Just look. This is a visual coincidence according to the consensus geology. According to accepted scientific explanation for these fluid curves in mountains and basins that rise and fall in coherent fashion requires a long sequence of unrelated events. First, the rocks have to be made at some depth miles below the surface under millions of years of heat and pressure. Then the ground has to roll in an unproven act called subduction, which stretches and heaves the land such that the rocks come to the surface as mountains and deep basins form between. The rocks have to push up by faulting from earthquake. And with this violent upheaval, huge slabs of rock do not get broken or crumble to dust as one would expect, but remain largely intact, somehow always ending up in horizontal shelves of rock at consistent dip angles. Then much of it has to erode away, sand grain by sand grain, over millions of years of rain and wind, which strangely sharpens the angles of what remains and produces slab-sided triangular buttresses on just one flank of each mountain. Remarkably, after all these chaotic processes of stretching, lifting, falling and eroding, for millions of years, instead of a pile of rubble, coherent forms of parallel rows of ridge lines and oval, round, and swirling structures of repeating fractal forms emerge. It makes one wonder at the marvelous coincidence of it all. How does a mix of ad hoc theories, guesswork really, and very poor guesswork at that, add up to anything as coherent as these structures? The answer is they don't. At least not in the electric universe. Coincidence isn't a scientific explanation in EU theory. These features are easily identified as coherent, wind-blown features created by winds of primordial times when Earth was in a different solar environment. The entire process of their formation will be explained. The environment was not unique, and that is why it can be explained. It exists today on another planet in the solar system. So we can look at these bizarre features on Earth and see that the same winds that shape this land are very similar to the winds that we see on Jupiter today. Image on the left, Earth. Image on the right is Jupiter. Earth left, Jupiter right. Jupiter, Earth. Jupiter, Earth. Take a close look at all the features because they aren't just similar, they are almost identical. You have just looked at, in a half dozen pictures, more conclusive evidence than any other theory about Earth's geology ever presented. Now let's expound. The cyclones on Jupiter produce violent downdraft winds like tightly rotating hurricanes. The quote craters on Earth are the result of supersonic downdraft winds as would be produced by such powerful cyclones. Not only that, but on close inspection, the mountains that form the rim of these craters display clear and indisputable sonic shockwave patterns, as described in previous arc blast articles. These features were indeed blowtorched. 
The reason these landforms on Earth and the clouds on Jupiter are similar is no coincidence. As will be shown, they trace to the same electrical formation endemic to planetary circuitry, that is, capacitance. The sustained storm, called the Great Red Spot, or GRS, is electrically analogous to primordial weather here on Earth. In fact, so similar is the Great Red Spot on Jupiter to the storms that once raged on Earth, we can visually correlate features. Why that is so will be explained in the course of these Eye of the Storm articles. The Colorado Plateau. Let's focus now on the Colorado Plateau because this high desert plateau and mountain region in North America has a special structure that makes it very easy to understand. It's easy because it was the eye of a storm where specific types of winds occurred that can be identified on the land. This will be shown as the result of three simple processes in Earth's electric circuitry. One, capacitance. Two, inductance. Three, ring currents. Electric storms produce the plateau, the Rocky Mountains, the Great Basin, and the Sierra Mountains. Storms like hurricanes and thunderstorms we experience today, but a primordial origin. When Earth's place in the solar system was a different environment. It was the electrical environment that was different. The electric field in the solar system affecting Earth was very different, and it caused the voltage potential between the ground and sky to go off the charts, rising to trillions of volts. It produced storms that covered the Earth with erupting volcanoes, lightning arcs, winds, and tsunamis that changed the face of the planet. Winds screamed at mock speeds, volcanoes erupted, country-sized sheets of magma, and shrouded Earth with ionic dust. The land became charged with electricity. Arcs erupted from Earth's interior and scoured its face with bolts of surface conductive lightning. Pools of mineral and moisture ionized below deposits and lifted mountains of earth away in drift currents in a powerful electric field, the likes of which we have never experienced in our time. What caused earth's electric field to jump to a state of hypertension and generate the kinds of storms that drifted mountains into form, as if made of whipped cream, is out of scope right now. I will explain this in the future. Oh yes, I will. But for now, let's stay on earth. There is evidence of layers upon layers of successive events. It's apparent that storms of varying magnitude recurred over time, just as they do today. What formed continents and blew mountains into shape was the culmination of many cycles of creation that left the thin veneer of surface geology we now observe. The geologic onion must be peeled one layer at a time and looked at with fresh eyes and electricity in the geophysics toolkit. We now look at the outermost layer evidence that Earth's geomagnetic field amped up to electroplate this layer is obvious everywhere. So we start with the evidence and follow where it leads. Where it leads today is an overlay of the great red spot of Jupiter on Earth that shows the approximate shape, location, and proportion of the multi-vortex storm that created the mountains and high desert plateaus of North America. The storm left its imprint on the land, its vortex outline, its internal turbulence, its vertical and horizontal jet stream winds and lightning arcs. The Great Red Spot is, as will be shown, the single most important key we have to understanding weather, geology, and our ancient past on Earth. I will, in these articles, put NASA and the rest of academia to shame. This will take some explaining, though, so please be patient and pay close attention. Before we compare and explain the features of the Great Red Spot and the Colorado Plateau bear in mind the evidence of electricity in geology and weather that we have already looked at. Each past article features an expression of the primordial storms we are discussing now and should be understood in that context. In Arc Blasts Part 1 through 3, the monocline, we looked at triangular harmonic waveforms on mountain flanks created by supersonic winds and reflected shock waves. In the Mars of Pinacate, we looked at volcanoes and discussed evidence of their cause being electrical discharges within or beneath Earth's crust, and how blossoms of violent eruption drew cinder cones to them by inflowing, rising winds similar to an anti-burst nuclear explosion. In Lightning Scarred Earth, parts 1 through 3, we looked at craters, pinnacles, dikes, and buttes formed by lightning, and how the combination of lightning arcs and ambient winds form mountains. 
in Sputtering Canyons Part 1 through 3, we looked at how dust-laden electric winds deposit plateaus and how an electric field can diffuse charge through the landscape and cause sputtering to eat away layers of those deposits. And in Summer Thermopile, Tornadoes, the Electric Model, and Nature's Electrode, we looked at electrical models to explain the form and behavior of lightning, thunderstorms, and tornadoes. The Electric Earth Approach. Each essay presents hypotheses for how electricity is the common denominator in every phenomena. The formula is quite simple. First, assume electricity is the one true force in nature. In other words, accept that acoustics, thermodynamics, fluid dynamics, chemistry, all are emergent properties of electricity acting in different phases of mediums. Ignore the emergent effects and identify the underlying electrical process, the waveforms, and circuitry involved. In every case, an electrical circuit can be found. The emergent effects simply fall into place. In the atmosphere, thermal layers and convection, wind flow and condensation, high pressure and low, all of these macro properties follow the thermoelectric properties of air and water vapor in a circuit. They form patterns of plasma currents diffusing as a result of capacitance in the earth and atmosphere. Virtually every field of physical science, nuclear physics, geophysics, fluid and thermodynamics, chemistry, climate models, you name it, critically rely on mathematical models based on known electrical processes such as charge diffusion, harmonics, and feedback. These are common denominators found in every large-scale, time-dependent, coherent feature of nature, which consensus science arbitrarily and incomprehensibly attributes to chaos. The quote chaos is not random or arbitrary and actually belies its underlying non-chaotic electrical makeup. Also, to see the underlying non-chaotic electrical makeup of nature, one must recognize electricity is a fractal phenomenon. How current diffuses in a medium, whether plasma, liquid, or solid, takes form in fractal elements that repeat in harmonic scales. So, their form can be identified. Charge diffusion, whether a Z-pinch discharge like a lightning bolt, partial plasma discharge like flames and vertices, or solid state diffusion as in semiconductors, takes form in scalable, harmonic, fractal patterns according to the laws of classical physics until it's charged as neutralized in atomic and molecular bonds. The patterns can be seen at every scale, from tiny crystals of silica to continental mountain arcs, and properly identifying them and their cause as the first level proof of electrical formation. Geologically, neutralized matter takes form as rocks. Ionized dust deposited by electric wind carries excess charge that must either find a bond, forming crystalline rock, or migrate along the electric field in currents until it finds a place to bond and neutralize its charge. If you need laboratory proof, look at any welding process, crystal fabrication, or electrochemical process where slag is produced. Rocks are manufactured without millions of years of pressure and temperature if electric current is applied. Electricity, even in small currents, can produce temperatures and pressures that exceed that of the sun. Rocky outcrops, boulder fields, quartz veins, gravel beds, sweeping slopes, triangular flat irons, volcanic fields, canyons and riverbeds, all display the effects of electrical diffusion and the secondary effects it produced. In the atmosphere, it takes form as clouds. Clouds should be regarded as aerial crystals because electrically they form identical to crystals with a nucleation, aggregation, and diffusion process that expands condensation in the atmosphere the same way crystals grow. The liquid crystal growth of clouds will organize into rotating storm systems as a result of capacitance in Earth's circuitry. In effect, Earth stores energy as a buildup of charge in its layers of crust and atmosphere. Then it dissipates the built-up charge in violent winds, lightning, and downpours. Storms are predictable phenomena of capacitor charge buildup and discharge across a partial plasma layer. Vortex winds, updraft winds, and downburst winds 
anvil clouds, mumatus, mesocyclone, and tornadoes. All are displays of energized cold plasma in a capacitor's electric field. Because these forms are fractal, they repeat their predictable forms wherever the electrical process that forms them is present. What changes from case to case are the elements in the circuitry, impedance, dielectric, voltage, degree of ionization, and polarity of plasma. Just as no two snowflakes ever match, they still follow identifiable patterns of crystallization which is fundamentally a process of charge diffusion. Likewise, the variables in the environment create chaos that never produces identical results, but the electrical processes, circuits, and fractal patterns they form remain the same and are identifiable. So, fractal patterns should appear everywhere, including other planets. And that is exactly the case with the Great Red Spot on Jupiter, because it is also a capacitor-induced storm. In part two of the Eye of the Storm, we'll explore the electric winds of Jupiter and discuss how they work. Please go to thedailyplasma.blog for more information.